Hi again, everyone. It is so nice to have you with us this afternoon for our November edition of the Race and Education series of the Hunt Institute. My name is Dan Worry. I am privileged to serve as the Senior Director of Early Learning at the Institute. And for those of you who may be joining us for the first time today, the Institute is the creation of our founder and chairman, Jim Hunt, who served four terms as the governor of North Carolina. The Institute is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year as an education policy resource to governors and state lawmakers and other senior elected and administrative officials across the country. We are very excited today to spotlight some very important work that we have been involved in over the past year in partnership with our friends at the Foundation for Child Development, the Bezos Family Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the development of positive racial identity during the years of early childhood. Uh, two quick uh, housekeeping notes as we get started. First, uh, know that today's uh, broadcast is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. If that is a service that you would find helpful, you can find the uh, controls down at the Zoom uh, toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Also at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A function. Later in the hour, we will be opening up the conversation and taking some questions from you in the audience. So as our panel is speaking this afternoon, if you got questions, please do feel free to type those into the Q&A bar and we'll try to get to some of those a little bit later in the hour. Moderating our discussion this afternoon is our very good friend and colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Jones, who serves as the president and CEO at Foundation for Child Development, which is based in New York City. Dr. Jones, we are so excited to have you with us today, and I'm going to turn things over to you to introduce the panel and get us started. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today's discussion was sparked over a year ago by the murder of George Floyd and the global protests that followed. As a philanthropic entity that has supported research on the well being of young children for over 100 years, the Foundation for Child Development engaged in a series of conversations with several of our peers, including the Bezos Family Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We all wondered what role might philanthropy play in advancing the field's knowledge of the development of positive ethnic and racial identity for all children. Connections to specific cultures, social groups, or nations strongly shape a person's identity. And we understood that this is a critical aspect of human development, one that has implications across the lifespan. However, we found surprisingly little empirical data on the overall development of ethnic and racial identity in young children, certainly less than we expected. And so in partnership with the Hunt Institute, we invited parents of young children, early care and education providers, state level early childhood leaders and researchers into more conversations. These discussions across geographic areas and political affiliations were designed to establish a research agenda that might help all of us to better support children's healthy development. Although our intent is to better understand the development of ethnic and racial identity in all children, our conversations began with a focus on children of color. With us today to help us expand on this work are three members of the groups that met previously. And so we are delighted to welcome Giovanna Archuleta, the Assistant Secretary for Native American Early Childhood Education and Care in New Mexico's Early Childhood Education and Care Department, Dr. Jennifer Adair, an Associate Professor at the University of Texas, and Dr. Stephanie Currington Jolly, an Associate Professor at Boston University. In the interest of achieving some degree of informality in our conversation, we'll be using first names. So Stephanie, let's begin with you. What do we know about the formation of ethnic and racial identity during early childhood? And how does this sense of identity influence things like health, psychological well-being, and learning in young children during adolescence and, and really into the transition into adulthood? Big question, but you can handle it. Stephanie? Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here to talk about this important issue. And I'm excited to have um, the, what I think is like one of the best questions here to talk about sort of the foundation of development as it relates to this. 
And there's sort of two caveats that I want to use to start off my comments. And at first, I would like to start off by really situating ethnic and racial identity within the realm of others' positive social and emotional identity development. And this is important to understand from both a developmental theory point of view and from a research point of view. So in terms of development, by doing this, it places the development of ethnic racial identity in line with these other aspects of positive identity formation that we know are developing rapidly during these early years and, and that we have a pretty good research base around. And um, however, one caveat that I wanna say is that we have to note that even within this larger realm of identity development, ethnic and racial identity um, is not exactly like the other positive forms of identity because it is even more strongly influenced by um, repeated negative messages that children might get about their identity. And in terms of research, it's important to situate um, this topic in that context because it will help us expand our empirical thinking about what are the components of social emotional development and how these components might work together. So for example, how empathy skills might be also related to racial awareness skills. Um, so having said that and set the caveats for those, I'll just move on to talking about um, this developmental trajectory. And um, I'll start by saying one thing is that it's important to consider that this development of ethnic racial identity is really important. Is the development of this is distinct um, in racially marginalized children in comparison to children who are white. So for example, the vast majority of racially and ethnically diverse children develop a clear sense of their identity and the sense of belonging to a racial group by the time they are in the early elementary years, for sure. Whereas for white children, the notion that they are part of an ethnic group, such as having a white identity, tends to happen later in development. And some for some children, it may be even as late as middle school or high school, some college even. And in fact, there are even some adults who have yet to grapple with their white identity and the understanding of what it means in terms of, their, of the social construction of race that we have created in this country. Also, even though the ethnic racial child development, um, even though that type of identity develops earlier, there are ways that this is both protective and, uh, and riskier for racially marginalized kids. So it's protective in the sense that they get a clear sense of belonging to a cultural group and a social community, but it's risky in that the children are therefore exposed to the harshness of discrimination and bias that are that is associated with that and their ethnic um, identity and their ethnic group. And this can weigh heavy on children and youth as they're growing up. And I think that because of this heaviness, there have been some scholars who are, have started to talk about the idea of racial stress and racial trauma and how families and teachers might be able to combat, combat this. <clears throat> and there's some very interesting work by Howard Stevenson and Rihanna Anderson with adolescents, and they're looking at the development of clinical interventions with this age group. But unfortunately, much of their work, um, even though it's that their work and recent work on racial ethnic identity occurs in adolescence. And I've had the opportunity, though, to explore this research literature, literature myself through participation in working groups funded by The Hunt and through my own work um, on a project with Sesame Workshop. And this work has provided me with the opportunity to really think about what are the effects of racial stress and trauma during the early years and how can we promote racial healing among our youngest children, particularly those who are at birth through age eight. And I'm very excited about being able to dig deep and to think about this. And because I'm a researcher who is so heavily invested in literacy and storytelling and conversations, my team and I at SEED have conceptualized a model that uses storybooks to fuel conversations about racial understanding and to develop strategies to protect against um, prejudice and discrimination. And I think, um, you had also asked, how does this might, how might this sort of trajectory relate to um, positive, um, how might it influence health, psycho psychological, and um, 
psychological well-being and learning. And what we know is that research says that um, having a positive ethnic racial identity is a positive pr um, predictor of children's school success and their social emotional functioning. So in essence, to have this positive identity makes children and then later adults mentally healthier and it helps them learn better. Thank you, Stephanie. It certainly is our goal to figure out ways to have this positive identity for all children and ways in which adults can really support that more. So thank you. Jennifer, your work focuses on the connections across agency, race, and discrimination in the early learning experiences of young children. Can you share with us some of your work around engaging children in authentic learning experiences about race, community, and their real lives? Please. Sure, thank you. It's um, a pleasure to be here and um, I'm honored to be with Stephanie and Giovanna today. Um, I think I'd like to really build on what Stephanie talked about in terms of this messaging that young children receive. And my work is really situated in school contexts. I work in pre-K with three, four and five year olds and in first grade with six and seven year olds. And that's where I spend months and up to a year at a time um, trying to understand how agency operates in classrooms that serve mostly brown and black children. Um, and when I do that, I see, I see very different kinds of learning experiences being offered to white wealthy children as compared to black and brown peers, even at the same economic level. The, the types of experiences that we offer children are very different. So if we're thinking about positive and negative messages that Stephanie talked about, and you're in, as we know, schools are quite segregated. And if you're in a school that where children have to raise their hand to say anything, where they sit on their hands, they put bubbles in their mouth, they walk in prison-like lines down the hallway, um, their stories are not welcomed, they're constantly interrupted by adults who are assessing them, um, if that's the experience, there are messages that accompany that experience. And my deep concern is that the experience, because children learn through their bodies, because they learn through their, their experiences, if their experience is constantly about compliance and it has nothing to do with their agency, their identities, the way that they are engaging in the world, that sends very significant messages. I think sometimes when we think about how are we going to work on positive racial identity development, um, I think sometimes we we immediately go to let's have conversations about race with young children. And I do think that's really important. But I don't know that it's very helpful if we read books about um, a range of intersecting identities, but we don't, but then we treat children poorly. <laughs> We don't allow them to talk to each other. We don't allow them to engage. We don't allow them to use their agency. So if I'm a child and I'm in a classroom and my everyday experience is about tasks, I'm not asked for my ideas. I'm not asked for my family stories. I'm not asked to share real life experiences or difficulties that I'm going through. That sends a message to me as a young child about what society expects of me. And I think oftentimes children of color at school get the message that they are, what we desire from them is for them to obey, is for them to be compliant. Not that we want their problem solving, their amazing sets of skills and knowledge that they bring from their communities that we want as a society, that we want um, their decision-making, we want their leadership, we want a full range of skills. Um, so that's a really important part of my work is trying to understand what agency looks like and who gets offered agentic learning experiences at school and who does not. Um, you can go, I'm in Austin, Texas, and you can go to a school on one side of Austin and 10 minutes away on another side of Austin and you'll see very, you can walk into the hallway and you'll see very different kinds of environments. And I think um the way in which we offer children um those experiences that will that has a huge role to play in how they think about learning um the 
the way that I know that besides theoretically is that I've spent years in classrooms now where I try to find, well, I try to find classrooms where children that serve majority children of color and that they have agency in the classroom that kids actually get to move around. It takes months to find a classroom that does this. It takes so long to find one. And when we do find one and we make films of those classrooms, people have a lot of different ideas about whether or not that's good for children. So I think that this, we're not used to seeing that in schools and that that connection of how racism operates and the deficit thinking that goes across from that ends up having consequences to what we actually offer children at school. Interesting. So I think I'm hearing you say, Jennifer, that we're not as a field in the same place about what does constitute a really effective strategy for positive racial identity. And we really do need more research about what it yeah, like we do. I think we I think we have a lot of understanding about what I think we have a lot of understanding about what it looks like and and how children demonstrate um, those those positive identities. But I think we are less sure how schools what it like how, why it's so difficult in schools to support that. Yeah. And maybe we can have some conversation about just mm -hmm. that, that today. But Giovanna, you were appointed as New Mexico's first assistant secretary for Native American early childhood education and care. That is quite a mouthful. Uh, can, can you share a little bit about th this important, the work that you do and why New Mexico decided to create a position dedicated to Native American early childhood issues? And I've got a second part for you. Uh, how's New Mexico working to build an early care and education system that is supportive of all children and still meeting the needs of Native American families? Thank you, Dr. Jones. It is a great honor and way to really acknowledge Native American Heritage Month. So thank you for inviting me. Um, New Mexico has 23 tribes, Pueblos and Nations. We have 19 Pueblos. We have three Apache tribes and the Navajo Nation. So this position was requested really by the tribal leaders as that connection to early education. It was intentionally and authentically written into the law that made our department. So each sovereign nation has a unique vision and they have so many strengths for how they teach their prenatal to five population. Um, to me, and I think to the, the tribes across New Mexico, this is such a sacred population and spiritual population. And a piece I don't want us to forget when we talk about racial and ethnic identity. Um, my position, this posi position holds and will strengthen government to government relationships, communication and consultation. And through that is how we will meet the needs of Native American families, because we need to learn from the experts and leaders of each community on how we support this sacred population. Um, as a department, we continue to support all families with various programming, but also looking at our own internal processes and our own internal beliefs and values so we can center those children that are most impacted by systems and policies is, is a way we're continuing to learn and grow. Keep in mind, we're just one year old, so we, we still have some growing to do ourselves. Thank you, Giovanna. So I'm going to toss a question out for all three of you. You can think about this. Uh, the conversations around race and education have too long, I think, begun from a deficit perspective, what children can't do, where they, where they aren't able. What can we do to kind of recast that conversation, those conversations in ways that support the development of positive racial identity in children of color and set positive expectations for all children. So shifting from that deficit model to something that can be really supportive for everyone. Who do you want to go first? Stephanie, you, you asked, you get to go first. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, sure. So um, I have thought about this and I think that 
in this context, what we're really talking about is a sort of a narrative change, a, a cultural narrative change away, and really with the understanding that um, narrative, our narratives shape our thoughts and our feelings. So we need to change the story. We need to change the narrative. And I think that happens when people um, truly understand um, that there's nothing wrong with being um, Black or Latine or Asian American or Indigenous American. These things are not a risk factor. Your identity in and of itself is not a risk factor. What is wrong is that we have created a society that has, um, that it strives in social structures that are built upon sort of these racist legacies. And these legacies put children in environmental circumstances that place them at risk. And it allows these environments to oper operate in um, a racist manner without any consequence, without any consequence. And often sometimes to these, um, these environments that we've allowed, that we have intentionally created or allowed to be created, um, it also breaks down those community supports and those cultural ways of knowing that um, people have used for centuries in order to survive and in order to um, raise the next generation. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we can really do as advocates and as um, researchers is really work together to focus on how we change this narrative, because it's only through changing this narrative that we can really dismantle the system and really start to create a new system that will invest and grow um, our, our children in a healthy way. I think it's a pod. I will constantly be asked to unmute myself. Jennifer? Sure, sure. Um, I should say to you, I, I think it's important to, before I answer this question, just to um, acknowledge that everything that I know and think about this are, are things that I've learned that I haven't actually experienced myself. Um, that as a white woman, I'm learning constantly from the communities that I work with. So I just want to put that out there. Um, but I think when it comes to how this thinking about how to change the narrative, as Stephanie set up for us, changing that narrative, at least in the school context, I've seen it done many ways where there's workshops on um, addressing bias or addressing deficit thinking. And then there's also um, addressing pedagogically or through curriculum, okay, let's have a higher or more sophisticated kind of curriculum or pedagogy that we're gonna do. What I think we are, would, it would be helpful to start moving towards or where I've seen the most shift or transformation um, with teachers and staff and administrators is when those are combined so you change your pedagogical stance because you real because you start understanding your bias and how racism impacts what you offer children and as you start understanding that either racism that you kind of carry inside of you or racism in the in the sense that we are all part of the society and we grow up with different vantage points of the of these ideas that you work through those at, as well alongside changing how you're teaching and engaging in the class. So when those two things are combined and it's pretty transparent, we are making changes because the way we have been teaching is not is more fueled by deficit thinking than it is a respect and a and a and a deep belief in the child and their community. So those two things going together. Um, so if you're, for example, if you're going to do project based learning and you're going to transform an entire school district over to project based learning, but without a sense of why you haven't been doing that or why you've been so narrow or so strict in the past, really being transparent about the, the impact of racism on how we teach and how we connect with families and communities and then moving that in and changing the pedagogy and once teachers offer children more agency and more projects, it actually does a lot of the work. 
because they see the children of color in their classroom be, doing so many sophisticated, caring, exciting things intellectually that they it starts changing their mind as well um, and getting rid of the bias. That shouldn't have been there in the first place, obviously, but really um, it can be really transforming for teachers too who weren't given those those same experiences when they were kids either. So I think part of it is thinking about how we are doing those transformations and trying to change those narratives. It's so interesting because I think in many cases, if we look at our teacher preparation programs, we don't really support helping teachers to give agency to all children. Uh, it's, uh, you know, at worst, if there are facts that kids have to memorize at worst, uh, but the notion that all children bring a sense of, of wanting to be who they are and they and and needing to have some kind of a th of power, if you will, yeah. in their in their choices, just giving yeah, children exactly. choice. Uh, but I do think it is it is it goes it can go back to teacher preparation. And I think we have to we have to think about that. Giovanna, let's get you into this notion of how do we change our our our, our notions of a deficit framing when we think about young children. So I apologize, everyone. My camera has gone out for some reason. Um, so you get to see my name. At least you got to see me in the start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, as we've done our work within our departments, and just knowing as adults, those conversations around racial and eth eth ethnic um, identity is hard at that level, you know, how do we as an agency and how do we as people support those conversations in the classroom? Because they are, they are courageous conversations, they are difficult conversations, and they have, those conversations sometimes have the ability to separate or, um, or cause some type of, like you said, deficit in the classroom. So, you know, if, we, if we're not doing it at this state level, you know, how are we supporting at the local level? So I think those conversations need to happen within our government system, within local systems, and I would even want to say federal systems. I think that's true. And, and you know, I think one of you mentioned this notion of um, just thinking of children as you identify ethnicity as a deficit, thinking of the children themselves as having a deficit. Uh, if you're if you're Latinx, if you're black, it's a deficit. It is really an interesting way in which we've come to think, and we don't even think about thinking in that way. Uh, here are children, therefore, we have to do something. And it is really the context in which children are living that can provide uh, a lack of opportunity, but but a challenge for us to to think about what we do. But sort of. We have an audience today that represents a broad variety of states and leadership roles. And, and we're thinking about recommendations that we'd like to make sure we give to this audience. And so uh, what is it that you would say uh, that folks can do? Where would you start? If you're interested in increasing a focus on racial identity in early childhood, what would you do? What's your advice to folks? Where would, where would we start? could take a moment to think about that. I just, I would like to say we start with ourselves. You know, what is our own racial and ethnic identity within ourselves? Um, I would say we start there. Stephanie and Jennifer, any other ideas? Where do we start? So I would say that we start with, um, systematic efforts to, um, to change our professional development um, education system within like higher eds and also, um, also our training um, systems that we have for um, in-service, you know, training that teachers receive. And I think we need to um, retrain our workforce just to help the workforce, everyone in the workforce understand the toxic effects of racism 
and how to unpack their own biases, as Giovanna was saying, and how to unpack their own identities. And, um, and then also helping them understand how to build learning environments that um, can prevent racism and that build children's identities and sense of agency and um, that we've been talking about. And I think that um, this relates to a change that we need to see throughout our curriculum in our higher ed programs. I think it's a change that we need to see also in the faculty members who are preparing the future generation of early childhood um, um, teachers in K through third grade third. And, um, and again, like I said, I think it needs to also be a change that we see throughout our larger um, in-service um, training as well for that is offered um, to teachers. And um, I think a serious commitment has to be made with infusing the workforce with the knowledge and skills that, um, that is needed in order to really do this work and to feel emotionally committed to do this work. And we can only do this by focusing on incorporating culturally responsive, anti-bias, anti-racist pedagogy throughout our whole system from the recruitment of our teachers to the curriculum, to the testing, to the ways in which we even um, um, conceptualize and measure what is quality. And, um, and I think the, the last thing I would say in terms of this is that we want to make sure that a field as a whole, that we make a serious commitment to really recruit and, and retain teachers of color who um, can work across all levels of our system from birth through grade three, because some of our most talented teachers have left the field because pay is not tenable, um, especially when we're in that sort of private um, community-based childcare um, part of the market. And so in essence, we're like driving our talent away. And some of that talent tends to be um, many of our ethnically and racially diverse uh, teachers. And I think that when we lose those, um, those teachers who do have lived experience about this, we are losing a huge, um, a huge bucket, a huge store of knowledge in as it relates to how to change things within our system. Thank you. Jennifer? I really agree with... Um what Giovanna and Stephanie both said. And I would add to that three things that I've been thinking about a lot lately that are more systemic and larger. They're kind of like wish lists almost. <laughs> we can think about this at that level. Um, the first thing is I think in whatever our contexts are, I think we can ask parents and caretakers, community members, um, their ideas about curriculum and their ideas about learning. I think we don't go to them enough. We invite them to participate in kind of silly, superficial ways, but we don't ask for their expertise and input. And especially for those of us who are white teachers or white passing teachers, we need their expertise to be successful with their children. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, we need their help, we need their expertise, we need their input, um, not just to bring cute things to parties, but we need we need their input on curriculum and teaching. The second thing I would say is that we, at least in early childhood and pre-K through third, I think this doesn't seem like it's going to address um, racial discrimination and, and positive racial identity development, but I really think it does, is we've got to change what is considered an ideal or high quality early childhood classroom. So if a principal walks in and is doing a teacher evaluation, most administrators, if the children are talking to each other without raising their hand, that is going to be marked down. If children are sitting quietly, they're sitting on their hands um, and they're just watching carefully, that is considered high quality. We have got to change what that looks like or else children don't get the experience of talking to each other, sharing ideas, sharing family expertise with each other, showing care for each other, initiating ideas, doing all kinds of leadership capabilities. So we, if we don't change, when you walk into a classroom and everybody's sitting on their hands 
and being super quiet, that's not a great sign <laughs> to me that that is a classroom that values the identities of children. Um, and the third one is that in order to do that, we're probably gonna have to change what we measure. We measure things that have nothing to do with whether or not a child is gonna be a healthy adult. So we need to start thinking about what we're measuring um, and racial identity development can be part of that measurement for white children as well as anyone else. How are we thinking about ourselves in relation to the larger society and can we match our measurements that we do, our assessment in early childhood with what we actually want to see in adults um, as they grow older? So those are big giant <laughs> things, wow. but um, that's really what I've been thinking about lately. So I'm hearing introspection uh, as the adults in children's lives to think about our own perceptions, which is hard because we're not always aware of why we're thinking what we're thinking, uh, to think about the, the preparation of teachers and how we will support a diverse workforce that really does connect with children and honors them and their families and their communities. Uh, connecting with parents, uh, you know, this is a partnership. And I think one of the things perhaps that the pandemic has shown us is that teachers and parents need each other desperately as we try to engage in, in continuing student learning. And, and, uh, and Janet, for this notion of, of thinking about high quality, fascinating. What is it that is high quality? You know, I, I, I think about uh, New York City where you know, there's a waiting list uh, when the child is one day old, you put them on a waiting list for the, the most uh, uh, exclusive uh, preschool programs that can cost up to $30,000 a year. And children aren't really looking at uh, ditto sheets and being quiet in those classrooms. There's a lot of, of sort of exploratory learning going on and maybe we could think about that. And then I think both Stephanie and Jennifer have been really interested in this notion of assessments and how do we how do we start to understand what is really happening in classrooms for all children, not just in terms of math and and um, and literacy, but in terms of who they are and and how they express themselves and how they become real people. Okay, so you didn't give us easy things to think about at all, but you did get us in this direction of thinking about about the development of ethnic and racial identity not just as an academic exercise, but what is its connection to the long-term success of, of our country, of a state's economy and, and workforce? If we don't really work hard to make sure that we've given all children a, a positive sense of who they are and what they are and agency, what are the implications for us as as a nation, as in, in states and in workforce. Anybody think about that? I can share a story um, to get us going that um, we talked about in our large research team yesterday. Um, we've been spending, we spent a couple of years in pre -K, Head Start pre-K classrooms where um, the children were supported in using their agency and we were really trying to understand their community building skills. I think sometimes we hear this idea that children are egoistic and they only think about themselves when they're really young, but we're finding out that that's absolutely not true. Um, we just probably didn't give them opportunities to show care and concern for other people. Um, and we were talking about a story of a young girl African-American girl um, in a class, and we can call her Jasmine. And she was, there was a new child in the class who was crying and she was supposed to be sitting down eating her breakfast. And the teacher kept telling her to go sit down and eat her breakfast. But she went over to the child who was crying at one of the other teachers and just rubbed his back. And the teacher kept saying, you need to go eat your breakfast. You need to go do this. And she just kept staying there and was asking him questions and trying to tell him about the fun things in the classroom. And that story to me illustrates how over time, 
the the embodiment of leadership and thinking higher level thinking skills like okay yeah sure i should be eating my breakfast but this is way more important for me to be doing and taking on those skills of care and leadership that's so important and i think over time if we think about what we want for adults and and what helps us to be healthy and relatively nobody can be happy all the time but like happy enough <laughs> adults um that we want we want children to be able to do what jasmine did but i think too often we shut that down and and we are particularly quick at shutting that down um with children of color, especially like Jasmine, who are experiencing a host of, of societal stressors. But, you know, they, that story reminds me um, of over time, what, what that can turn out to be and that we really need Jasmine's in the world. Yeah. Uh, Giovanna, I think you had some technical issues. So we were, we were trying to think about um, how you see supporting positive racial and ethnic identity formation as, as critical to, I guess, the long-term success of, of a state, of the state's economy, of their workforce. What are the implications for that from your perspective? Well, I think here at ECCD, we are you know, taking that journey of really learning and unlearning systems. Um, and again, that takes time. How we see it is looking to those experts of the community. I mean, to, to Stephanie's point about, you know, having those traditional knowledge systems, you know, and we as native people have been here for hundreds of years. We have, obviously our system has worked and continue to work since, you know, at one point we were a period of assimilation and removal. And yet we are still speaking languages, we are still speaking, we are still practicing culture. And so how do you tap into those knowledge systems within your communities that have been working for hundreds of years to benefit that classroom experience and to really hone in on that um, racial and ethnic identity of children in the classroom? Thank you. Stephanie, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, I, um, I think this is a, a really hard one and because um, it's a big one and I would come down, my answer comes down to thinking about it as, um, as it relates to like mental health, like liking it into to mental health. So if we think about a general pop, our general adult population. If we know that we have a general adult population and people are experiencing sort of depression, um, low self-esteem, not feeling a high sense of self-efficacy, et cetera, those aren't good workers, right? And if we go back to my original premise of saying that having a positive racial and ethnic identity is part of what is typical um, healthy uh, social and emotional development in children. So if we, if we do, if children who later become adults do not have that positive aspect of their identity developed, then there will be something that is lacking in terms of their social and their emotional um, skills, sort of like toolkit and connection, you know, with themselves. And so they ultimately won't be as happy and as well-rounded and have the self-esteem and the sense of self-efficacy that they would actually need to be as productive as they could in society. So it, so when you frame the question to me this way, I'm thinking it helps us all if we are investing in young children's um, ethnic and racial identity, because in the end, it helps them be stronger people, stronger, healthier people who will then be adults who are more um, functioning and contribute more to our larger um, our, our larger workforce, but not just our workforce, it's like our whole um, communal efforts and connections that we have with each other um, as adults. So and it's 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 so it's so important to to be able to to walk the planet feeling whole and who you are. Um, it seems 
that that should be just an understood, a given. Uh, and it doesn't mean that feeling whole and who you are diminishes anyone else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to. We can all feel whole and who we are and, and want that for ourselves. So there are there are a whole lot of questions uh, in the, in the Q&A box. I'm just looking here. So someone wants to ask, is it possible to incorporate racial identity into the early, into an early learning curriculum? How can we prepare and support educators in supporting racial identity in children birth to five? But how, is this a different curriculum in and of itself? Are there things we can do? How do you, what, is it, what does it mean to decide we're gonna now infuse a curriculum with, with these notions of racial identity? Anybody? Um, so I'll jump in here and this is where I get all excited because it's based on, you know, this new sort of burgeoning idea that I have that I, I think it's through stories and I think it's through storytelling because who we are as human beings, again, we come to know and understand ourselves and our communities through stories. And so I think that um, when we come to understand that part of our identity, that is our ethnic and racial identity, it will be through stories. And I think that we can incorporate stories, storybooks, storytelling, you know, stories from home. We can incorporate all of those things into our classrooms right now in terms of what we're doing, regardless of the curriculum that we're using. And I think that what we have to do as educators is to allow that space and be also be intentional about creating that space for, for children to come in and to be able to tell their stories of their communities and their homes. And I think we can also be intentional by looking at these storybooks. Like, so one of the things that we're, we, we do in SEED is that we publish um, a uh, book list that we call racially affirming book list. And so we have one for um, um, African-American children and families or black slash African-American children and families. We have one for um, Asian American Pacific Islander um, families and my, well, I don't know them, not, they're not my colleagues. Like I don't know them, but I love this publisher because it's called Lee and Lowe and Lee and Lowe publishers has just published um, a similar book list for um, um, Native American children and families. And so I think that, you know, as teachers, we can start to look at those book lists and get ideas and start to share those stories within our classroom and engage children in conversations around those stories, those characters, those situations. And I think that is a very healthy way that um, teachers can begin to engage in this process. I also just want to jump in and say, you know, get an understanding of what that perception of those identities are. You know, what do children think, um, how do Native, Native Americans live? What is your perception of their culture? And then, you know, come to the table and talk about you know, what is their actual, how do they live? What is their culture? That is an opportunity to learn really about that whole child and, and what that whole child brings to a classroom which includes, again, their culture, their language, their spirituality. Um, that could be another tip for understanding cultures. Jennifer, anything to add here? Um, on a, on a more of a policy side, I think when um, at the district and state levels, when people are making decisions about curriculum, I think thinking about teacher agency and children's agency is really important and whether or not there is space for those stories to be shared. Is, is there space for a range of expertise to be part of what's happening, of, of where the content comes from? Um, I go into lots and lots of schools where the schedule is put up in 15 minute increments and your horizontal team all has to be on the same 15 minute increments. It's really hard for children to share their stories and to build curriculum and, and projects around their interests and their stories if we are operating that way. And again, to your point, um, Jacqueline, when you go to your fancy white and wealthy schools, that's not, what's, that's not how things are operating. And so I think as we open up and really support teacher agency, especially teachers of color who are teaching and trying to, to make those connections and have um, ways of really relating to children and their communities. And then we shut them down too. This seems really problematic. 
Um, and, and I think that's a way of thinking about ways we can broaden curriculum and what we're offering to make, There's to be some, really intentional about what we choose. Exactly. There's some interesting work that Beverly Falk has done at the City University of New York, doing videos of, of what is inquiry-based learning in public school settings uh, with um, incredibly diverse kids, black and white teachers, mm -hmm. really good pictures of what, um, of what good practice looks like. Beverly Falk, City University of New York, give her a plug. Uh, there is a, a hard question here. So we have a question that says, can you comment on the concern that some families have because of cultural beliefs and survival history that children should not exhibit agency in school or home, but should be obedient to adults and encourage and, and engage in academic activities? This has been a conflict for us, for some families from some immigrant groups. Of course, the families are proud of their racial and, and ethnic identity and believe the, this is the best for their children. So, so Jennifer, you, you're the agency lady, but that's not always <laughs> what, uh, what, what parents mm -hmm. are thinking is, is the best thing. I really appreciate this question because often I think people have this question, but they don't always ask it. And um, not to plug my book, but we just wrote a book on this entire study and there's a whole, it's called Segregation by Experience. And it, there's a whole a number of chapters, well, there's one particular chapter that's really devoted to parents' ideas about agency. And this this concern about safety and the re parents making decisions in the real world. And if there there's deep concerns about children, if they, um, there's worries that if their children believe that they can give their full expression of their ideas or be really creative or initiate stuff that they will be in harm's way in the larger just in their everyday lives and so i think um there are a couple of ways where parents told us that they feel really comfortable there's aspects of agency that a lot of immigrant parents feel comfortable with the book goes into this in much more detail but um off the top of my head one of the biggest ones were questions the ability for children to ask questions and Maybe children aren't initiating ideas right away, but something that parents felt really comfortable and excited about and was a sign of learning to them across multiple immigrant groups was this ability of their children to ask questions that they worried when their children weren't asking questions. So in, in, our, in the research that I do, we show videos and we ask parents what they think about the learning practices that are in the films. And um, if anyone's really interested in that, I think sharing films and, and bringing parents together and having conversations about which practices they feel really comfortable with and which practices they want more information about and they want to think about. Um, I also have worked with a lot of parents to try to create ways to talk to children about at school, this is something that we're doing um, and you need to talk about, you know, and it, this is what we're doing at school, but this may not be what you're doing everywhere else. Um, and to be really realistic, I think young children can handle that. They have to do that all the time. Um, and this conversation is just as important for white children. I can't emphasize that enough. They, they need to have these conversations about, about what, what things are like for them as well as lots of people in the community. So I don't think that, that that's just for immigrant families, I think. That's an important conversation. Kids understand fairness. They understand about equity more than we think. A continuing conversation with parents, I think, is is what you really need to have as you try to establish this partnership. Uh, we are at two fifty five. I don't know how this happened, uh, but. I, I do want each of you to, you know, you've got the, the 30 second last say before, before Dan comes back. Um, you've had a lot of conversation here uh, and we probably need much more time to, to really engage deeply in this, but if there's one charge that you could give to the participants today, what would you tell them? Uh, and so you've got, well, I can give you a minute maybe. Uh, so Stephanie, you wanna give folks out there one charge. What would you say? You're on mute. Sorry about that. 
So I guess if I have to pick one, um, hmm. I would want, I would say the charge is to really invest in our workforce, um, really invest in our workforce um, to help us as a, as a workforce. And I mean, from the in-classroom teachers to our policy leaders, et cetera, all the way up to really help us ex be able to explore and understand um, ethnic and racial identity in these early years and invest in um, the time that is needed for us to really learn how to help guide children in developing these I identities in a healthy way. Thank you, Giovanna. I think I wanna take one more face down to Stephanie's is also listening to the parents. So in, a, in addition to the workforce, we need to listen to the parents and the ideas and expertise they come with. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, I would say um, in addition to the two um, that Joanna and Stephanie shared, to think really carefully about the learning experiences that we offer young children. And before we blame children or their families or their communities, before we give in to deficit thinking, that we think really careful about what we're doing, what we're offering them and the kinds of experiences that we're, that we're making possible for them to participate in and what messages that we are sending them. Thank you so much. Uh, each of you has brought an extraordinary perspective to this really complicated conversation. And, and we are so grateful that you have been able to give your, your expertise here today. I know that there are many, many questions. This has been a very active chat, I'm thrilled. Uh, and so thank you out there, the, who, you've, the participants, uh, and we're just so sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. But Dan, uh, we're gonna turn it back over to you. Thank Declan, you. thank you so much. And everyone, I want to echo the uh, the comments that are coming in through the chat. What a fantastic conversation. We knew it would be a, a, a really rich dialogue, and we are just so grateful to each of you for taking time out to, uh, to be with us today. As we wrap up, I did want to uh, put in a quick plug see if I can get this, uh, this screen sharing going and um, share with you that we will be back together for the Hunt Institute's Early Efforts uh, webinar series, which is our, our dedicated early childhood series. On December 7th, we are going to be partnering with the Alliance for Early Success. You may know that the Alliance puts out uh, a very um, interesting 50-state uh, report on early childhood policy around this time each year. And so we're going to join together on December 7th uh, for what we're calling 2021's Big Wins for Little Kids, right? So we're going to summarize uh, some of the great policy innovations that have happened across the country. You'll see we've got a, a larger than normal panel, a cast of thousands that will be, uh, be joining us for early efforts. And this will actually be uh, kind of a special uh, session. Uh, instead of just interacting in the Q&A, as we have uh, done today and done historically, it's going to be a two-hour interactive session. The first hour will be uh, following a webinar format like we have uh, done today. And then in the second hour, you'll have the opportunity to rejoin us as a Zoom meeting and break into uh, kind of interest-based uh, discussion groups with our panelists and actually interact live on camera uh, and, and participate in that Q&A. So we hope that you will join us on December 7th for what we know promises to be a fantastic recap of the year 2021. A lot of amazing uh, innovation uh, happening all across the country. But for today, I want to uh, take one more moment to thank certainly our moderator, Dr. Jacqueline Jones, President and CEO of the Foundation for Child Development in New York City. Jacqueline, thank you for taking time to lead this conversation and for all of your leadership on, on this topic as well. And, and also to our panel, uh, Assistant Secretary Giovanna Archuleta, 
of the New Mexico Early Childhood Education and Care Department, Dr. Stephanie Curtin and Jolly of Boston University, and Dr. Jennifer Keyes Adair of the University of Texas at Austin. We are so grateful to all of you for taking the time and grateful to all of you uh, for taking time out of your schedule to join us and participate in this conversation today. By the way, if you missed any of uh, today's session, know that it will be on our YouTube page here in the in the coming days so you can catch back up and see anything that you may have missed. For now, we'll say goodbye and we hope to see you on December 7th. Thanks for joining us, everyone.